Chapter 12 of What Katie Did This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Tanti What Katie Did by Susan Coolidge Chapter 12, Two Years Afterward It was a pleasant morning in early June. A warm wind was rustling the trees, which were covered thickly with half-opened leaves and looked like fountains of green spray thrown high into the air. Dr. Carr's front door stood wide open. Through the parlor window came the sound of piano practice, and on the steps, under the budding roses, sat a small figure, busily sewing. This was Clover. Little Clover still though more than two years had passed since we saw her last, and she was now over fourteen. Clover was never intended to be tall. Her eyes were as blue and sweet as ever, and her apple blossom cheeks as pink. But the brown pigtails were pinned up into a round knot, and the childish face had gained almost a womanly look. Old Mary declared that Miss Clover was getting quite young ladyfied, and Miss Clover was quite aware of the fact, and mightily pleased with it. It delighted her to turn up her hair, and she was very particular about having her dresses made to come below the tops of her boots. She had also left off ruffles, and wore narrow collars instead, and little cuffs with sleeve buttons to fasten them. These sleeve buttons, which were a present from cousin Helen, Clover liked best of all her things. Papa said that he was sure she took them to bed with her, but of course that was only a joke, though she certainly was never seen without them in the daytime. She glanced frequently at these beloved buttons as she sat sewing, and every now and then laid down her work to twist them into a better position or give them an affectionate pet with her forefinger. Pretty soon the side gate swung open, and Philly came round the corner of the house. He had grown into a big boy. All his pretty baby curls were cut off, and his frocks had given place to jacket and trousers. In his hand he held something, what Clover could not see. "'What's that?' she said as he reached the steps. "'I'm going upstairs to ask Katie if these are ripe,' replied Phil, exiting some currants faintly streaked with red. "'Why, of course they're not ripe!' said Clover, putting one into her mouth. Can't you tell by the taste? They're as green as can be. I don't care. If Katie says they're ripe, I shall eat them, answered Phil defiantly, marching into the house. What did Philly want? asked Elsie, opening the parlor door as Phil went upstairs. Only to know if the currants are ripe enough to eat. How particular he always is about asking now, said Elsie. He's afraid of another dose of salts. I should think he would be, replied Clover, laughing. Johnny says she was never so scared in her life as when Papa called them and they looked up and saw him standing there with the bottle in one hand and the spoon in the other. Yes, went on Elsie. And you know, Dory held his in his mouth for ever so long and then went round the corner of the house and spat it out. Papa said he had a good mind to make him take another spoonful. But he remembered that after all, Dory had the bad taste a great deal longer than the others, so he didn't. I think it was an awful punishment, don't you? Yes, but it was a good one, for none of them have ever touched the green gooseberries since. Have you got through practicing? It doesn't seem like an hour yet. Oh, it isn't. It's only 25 minutes. But Katie told me not to sit more than half an hour at a time without getting up and running round to rest. I'm going to walk twice down to the gate and twice back. I promised her I would. And Elsie set off, clapping her hands briskly before and behind her as she walked. Why, what is Bridget doing in Papa's room? She asked as she came back the second time. She's flapping things out the window. Are the girls up there? I thought they were cleaning the dining room. They're doing both. Katie said it was such a good chance having Papa away that she would have both the carpets taken up at once. There isn't going to be any dinner today, only just bread and butter and milk and cold ham up in Katie's room, because Debbie is helping too, so as to get through and save Papa all the fuss. And see, exhibiting her sewing, Katie's making a new cover for Papa's pincushion, and I'm hamming the ruffle to go round it. How nicely you ham, said Elsie. I wish I had something for Papa's room too. There's my washstand mats, but the one for the soap dish isn't finished. Do you suppose if Katie would excuse me from the rest of my practicing I could get it done? I have a great mind to go and ask her. There's her bell, said Clover as a little tinkle sounded upstairs. I'll ask her if you like. No, let me go. I'll see what she wants. 
but Clover was already halfway across the hall, and the two girls ran up side by side. There was often a little strife between them as to which should answer Katie's bell, both liked to wait on her so much. Katie came to meet them as they entered, not on her feet, that alas was still only a far off possibility, but in a chair with large wheels with which she was rolling herself across the room. This chair was a great comfort to her. Sitting in it she could get to her closet and her bureau drawers and help herself to what she wanted without troubling anybody. It was only lately that she had been able to use it. Dr. Carr considered her doing so as a hopeful sign, but he had never told Katie this. She had grown accustomed to her invalid life at last, and was cheerful in it, and he thought it was unwise to make her restless by exciting hopes, which might, after all, end in fresh disappointment. She met the girls with a bright smile as they came in, and said, Oh, Clovey, it was you I rang for. I am troubled for fear Bridget will meddle with the things on Papa's table. You know, he likes them to be left just so. Would you please go and remind her that she is not to touch them at all? After the carpet is put down, I want you to dust the table so as to be sure that everything is put back in the same place. Would you? Of course I will, said Clover, who was a born housewife and dearly loved to act as Katie's Prime Minister. Shan't I fetch you the pincushion too, while I'm there? Oh yes, please do. I want to measure. Katie, said Elsie, those mats of mine are most done, and I would like to finish them and put them on Papa's washstand before he comes back. Mayn't I stop practicing now and bring my crotchet up here instead? Will there be plenty of time to learn the new exercise before Miss Phillips comes, if you do? I think so, plenty. She doesn't come to the Friday, you know. Well then, it seems to me that you might just as well as not. And Elsie, dear, run into Papa's room first and bring me the drawer out of his table. I want to put that in order myself. Elsie went cheerfully. She laid the drawer across Katie's lap and Katie began to dust and arrange the contents. Pretty soon Clover joined them. Here's the pincushion, she said. Now we'll have a nice quiet time all by ourselves, won't we? I like the sort of day when nobody comes in to interrupt us. Somebody tapped at the door as she spoke. Katie called out, Come! And then marched a tall, broad shouldered lad with a solemn, sensible face and a little clock carried carefully in both his arms. This was Dory. He had grown and improved very much since you saw him last, and is turning out clever in several ways. Among the rest, he has developed a strong turn for mechanics. Here's your clock, Katie, he said. I've got it fixed so that it strikes all right. Only you must be careful not to hit the striker when you start the pendulum. Have you really? said Katie. Why, Dory, you're a genius. I'm ever so much obliged. It's four minutes to eleven now, went on Dory. So it'll strike pretty soon. I guess I'd better stay and hear it, so as to be sure that it is right. That is, he added politely, unless you're busy and would uh, rather not. I'm never too busy to want you, old fellow, said Katie, stroking his arm. Here, this drawer is arranged now. Don't you want to carry it into Papa's room and put it back into the table? Your hands are stronger than Elsie's. Dory looked gratified. When he came back, the clock was just beginning to strike. There! he exclaimed. That's splendid, isn't it? But alas, the clock did not stop at eleven. It went on, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Dear me, said Clover, what does all this mean? It must be a day after tomorrow at least. Dory stared with open mouth at the clock, which was still striking as though it would split its sides. Elsie, screaming with laughter, kept count. Thirty, thirty-one, oh Dory, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. You've bewitched it, Dory, said Katie, as much entertained as the rest. Then they all began counting. Dory seized the clock, shook it, slapped it, turned it upside down. But still, the sharp vibrating sounds continued, as if the clock having got its way for once meant to go on till it was tired out. At last, at the 130th stroke, it suddenly ceased. And Dory, with a red face, amazed countenance, faced the laughing crowd. 
It's very queer, he said. But I'm sure it's not because of anything I did. I can fix it, though, if you let me try again. May I, Katie? I'll promise not to hurt it. For a moment, Katie hesitated. Clover pulled her sleeve and whispered, Don't! Then, seeing the mortification on Dory's face, she made up her mind. Yes! Take it, Dory. I'm sure you'll be careful. But if I were you, I'd carry it down to Wetherills first of all, and talk it over with them. Together you could hit on just the right thing. D don't you think so? Perhaps, said Dory. Yes, yes, I think I will. Then he departed with the clock under his arm, while Clover called after him teasingly. Lunch at 132 o'clock, don't forget. No, I won't, said Dory. Two years before, he would not have borne to be laughed at so good-naturedly. How could you let him take your clock again? said Clover, as soon as the door was shut. He'll spoil it, and you think so much of it. I thought he would feel mortified if I didn't let him try, replied Katie quietly. I don't believe he'll hurt it. Whether his man likes Dory, and he'll show him what to do. You were real good to do it, responded Clover. But if it had been mine, I don't think I could. Just then the door flew open, and Johnny rushed in, two years taller but otherwise looking exactly as she used to. Oh, Katie, she gasped, won't you please tell Philly not to wash the chickens in the rainwater tub? He's put in every one of Speckles and is just beginning on Dame Durden's. I'm afraid one little yellow one is dead already. Why? He mustn't! Of course he mustn't! said Katie. What made him think of such a thing? He says they're dirty because they've just come out of eggshells. And he insists that the yellow on them is yolk of egg. I told him it wasn't, but he wouldn't listen to me. And Johnny wrung her hands. Clover! cried Katie. Won't you run down and ask Philly to come up to me? Speak pleasantly, you know. I spoke pleasantly, real pleasantly, but it wasn't any use, said Johnny, on whom the wrongs of the chicks had evidently made a deep impression. What a mischief Phil is getting to be, said Elsie. Papa says his name ought to be Pickle. Pickles turn out very nicely sometimes, you know, replied Katie, laughing. Pretty soon Philly came up, escorted by Clover. He looked a little defiant, but Katie understood how to manage him. She lifted him into her lap, which, big boy as he was, he liked extremely, and talked to him so affectionately about the poor little shivering chicks that his heart was quite melted. I didn't mean to hurt them, really and truly, he said. But they were all dirty and yellow, with egg, you know, and I thought you'd like me to clean them up. But that wasn't egg, Philly. It was dear little clean feathers like a canary bird's wings. Was it? Yes, and now the chickies are as cold and forlorn as you would feel if you tumbled into a pond and nobody gave you any dry clothes. Don't you think you ought to go and warm them? How? Well, in your hands, very gently, and then I would let them run around in the sun. I will, said Philly, getting down from her lap. Only kiss me first, because I didn't mean to, you know. Philly was very fond of Katie. Miss Pettingle said it was wonderful to see how that child let himself be managed. But I think the secret was that Katie didn't manage, but tried to be always kind and loving and considerate of Phil's feelings. Before the echo of Phil's boots had fairly died away on the stairs, old Mary put her head into the door. There was a distressed expression on her face. Miss Katie, she said, I wish you'd speak to Alexander about putting the woodshed in order. I don't think you know how bad it looks. I don't suppose I do, said Katie, smiling and then sighing. She had never seen the woodshed since the day of her fall from the swing. 
Never mind, Mary, I'll talk to Alexander about it and he shall make it all nice. Mary trotted downstairs satisfied. But in the course of a few minutes, she was up again. There is a man with a box of soap, Miss Katie, and here's the bill. He says it's resatted. It took Katie a little time to find her purse, and then she wanted her pencil and account book. And Elsie had to move from her seat at the table. Oh dear, she said. I wish people wouldn't keep coming and interrupting us. Who'll be next, I wonder? She was not left to wonder long. Almost as she spoke, there was another knock at the door. Come in, said Katie rather wearily. The door opened. Shall I? said a voice. There was a rustle of skirts, a clatter of boot heels, and the Mogan Clark swept into the room. Katie could not think who it was at first. She had not seen a Mogan for almost two years. I found the front door open, explained the Mogan in her high-pitched voice, and as nobody seemed to hear when I rang the bell, I ventured to come right upstairs. I hope I'm not interrupting anything private. Not at all, said Katie politely. Elsie, dear, move up that low chair, please. Do sit down, Amogen. I'm sorry nobody answered your ring, but the servants are cleaning house today, and I suppose they didn't hear. So Amogen sat down and began to rattle on in her usual manner, while Elsie from behind Katie's chair took a wide-awake survey of her dress. It was of cheap material, but very gorgeously made and trimmed, with flounces and puffs, and the Mogan wore a jet necklace and long black earrings, which jingled and clicked when she waved her head about. She still had the little round curls stuck onto her cheeks, and the sea wonder then knew what kept them in their places. By and by, the object of Mogan's visit came out. She had called to say goodbye. The Clark family were all going back to Jacksonville to live. Did you ever see the brigand again? asked Clover, who had never forgotten that eventful tale told in the parlor. Yes, replied the Mogan, several times, and I get letters from him quite often. He writes beautiful letters. I wish I had one with me so that I could read you a little bit. You would enjoy it, I know. Let me see, perhaps I have. And she put her hand into her pocket. Sure enough, there was a letter. Clover couldn't help suspecting that the Mogan knew it all the time. The brigand seemed to write a bold black hand, and his notepaper and envelope was just like anybody else's. But perhaps his band had surprised a peddler with a box of stationery. Let me see, said the Mogan, running her eye down the page. A sword, Mogan. That would it interest you. Hmm. 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 Ah! Here's something. I took dinner at the Rock House on Christmas. It was lonesome without you. I had roast turkey, roast goof, roast beef, mince pie, plum pudding, and nuts and raisins. A pretty good dinner, was it not? But nothing tastes first rate when friends are away. Katie and Clover stirred, as well they might. Such language from a brigand. John Billings has bought a new horse. Continued the Mogan. Hmm. 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 Him. I don't think there's anything else you'd care about. Oh, yes. Just here, at the end, is some poetry. Come, little dove, with azure wing, and brood upon my breast. That's sweet, ain't it? Hasn't he reformed? said Clover. He writes as if he had. Reformed? cried the Mogan with a toss of the jingling gearings. He was always just as good as he could be. There was nothing to be said in reply to this. Katie felt her lips twitch, and for fear she would be rude and laugh out, she began to talk as fast as she could about something else. All the time she found herself taking measure of Mogan, and thinking, Did I ever really like her? How queer! Oh, what a wise man Papa is! Mogan stayed half an hour. Then she took her leave. She never asked how you were, cried Elsie indignantly. I noticed she didn't, not once. Oh well, I suppose she forgot. 
We were talking about her, not about me, replied Katie. The little group settled down again to their work. This time an hour went by without any more interruptions. Then the doorbell rang, and Bridget, with a disturbed face, came upstairs. Miss Katie, she said, it's old Mrs. Warrett, and I reckon she's come to spend the day, for she's brought her bag. Whatever shall I tell her? Katie looked dismayed. Oh dear, she said, how unlucky. What can we do? Miss Worrett was an old friend of Aunt Izzy's, who lived in the country, about six miles from Burnet, and was in the habit of coming to Dr. Carr's for lunch, on days when shopping or other business brought her into town. This did not occur often, and as it happened, Katie had never had to entertain her before. Tell her you're busy and can't see her, suggested Bridget. There is no dinner nor nothing, you know. The Katie of two years ago would probably have jumped at this idea, but the Katie of today was more considerate. No, she said. I don't like to do that. We must just make the best of it, Bridget. Run down, Clover, dear, that's a good girl, and tell Mrs. Warrett that the dining room is all in confusion, but that we're going to have lunch here. And after she's rested, I should be glad to have her come up. And, oh, Clovey, give her a fan the first thing. She'll be so hot. Bridget, you can bring up the luncheon just the same. Only take out some canned peaches by way of a dessert. And make Mrs. Warrett a cup of tea. She drinks tea always, I believe. I can't bear to send the poor old lady away when she has come so far, she explained to Elsie after the others were gone. Pull the rocking chair a little this way, Elsie, and, oh, Push all those little chairs back against the wall. Mrs. Ward broke down in one the last time she was here, don't you recollect? It took some time to cool Mrs. Ward off. So nearly twenty minutes passed before a heavy, creaking step on the steps announced that the guest was on her way up. Elsie began to giggle. Mrs. Ward always made her giggle. Katie had just time to give her a warning glance before the door opened. Mrs. Worth was the most enormously fat person ever seen. Nobody dared to guess how much she weighed, but she looked as if it might be a thousand pounds. Her face was extremely red, in the coldest weather she appeared hot, and on a mild day she seemed absolutely ready to melt. Her bonnet strings were flying loose as she came in, and she fanned herself all the way across the room, which shook as she walked. Well, dear, she said, as she plumped herself into the rocking chair. And how do you do? Very well, thank you, replied Katie, thinking that she never saw Mrs. Warrett look half so fat before, and wondering how she was to entertain her. And how's your pa? inquired Mrs. Warrett. Katie answered politely, and then asked after Mrs. Warrett's own hand. Well, I'm so to be around was the reply, which had the effect of sending Elsie into a fit of compulsive laughter behind Katie's chair. I had business at the bank, continued the visitor, and I thought while I was about it I'd step up to Mrs. Pettingles and see if I couldn't get her to come and let out my black silk. It was made quite a piece back, and I seem to have fleshed up since then, for I can't make the hooks and eyes meet at all. But when I got here, she was out, so I'd my walk for nothing. Do you know where she's sewing now? No, said Katie, feeling her chair shake and heaving her own countenance with difficulty. She was here for three days last week to make Johnny a school dress, but I haven't heard anything about her since. Elsie, don't you want to run downstairs and ask Bridget to bring a... Uh, a glass of iced water for Mrs. Worrett. She looks warm after her walk. Elsie, dreadfully ashamed, made the bolt from the room and hid herself in the whole closet to have her laugh out. She came back after a while with a perfectly straight face. Luncheon was brought up. Mrs. Worrett made a good meal and seemed to enjoy everything. She was so comfortable that she never stirred till four o'clock. Oh, how long that afternoon did seem to the poor girl, sitting there and trying to think of something to say to their vast visitor. 
At last Mrs. Worried got out of her chair and prepared to depart. Well, she said, tying her bonnet strings, I've had a good rest and feel all the better for it. Ain't some of you young folks coming out to see me one of these days? I'd like to have you first rate, if you will. Taint every girl would know how to take care of a fat old woman and make her feel at home as you have be, Katie. I wish your aunt could see you all as you are now. She'd be right, please, I know that. Somehow this sentence rang pleasantly in Katie's ears. Ah, don't laugh at her, she said later in the evening, when the children, after their tea in the clean, fresh-smelling dining room, were come up to sit with her, and Jessie, in her pretty pink lawn and white shawl, had dropped in to spend an hour or two. She's a real kind old woman, and I don't like to have you. It isn't her fault that she's fat, and Aunt Izzy was fond of her, you know. It is doing something for her when we can show a little attention to one of her friends. I was sorry when she came, but now it's over, I'm glad. It feels so nice when it stops aching, quoted Elsie mischievously, while Jessie whispered to Clover. Isn't Katie sweet? Isn't she? replied Clover. I wish I was half so good. Sometimes I think I shall really be sorry if she ever gets well. She's such a dear old darling to us all sitting there in her chair that it wouldn't seem so nice to have her anywhere else. But then I know it's horrid in me. And I don't believe she'd be different or grow slam-bang and horrid like some of the girls, even if she were well. Of course she wouldn't, replied Jessie. End of 12. Recording by Mark Tanti, Malta.